when you're on death row. It feels like a gun is literally being held to your head every day. It is a day-to-day -day assault on a human soul. I had my life stolen away for 25.5 years for a crime I didn't commit. You can't get that time back. There are countless people doing hard time in American prisons for crimes they didn't commit. I've interviewed dozens of them for my podcast, and now we're bringing these powerful human stories to your screens. Together, we can help shed light on some of the current problems plaguing our criminal injustice system. I'm Jason Flom, and this is Wrongful Conviction. Jimmy Dennis spent over 25 long years on death row for a crime he didn't commit. This is his story. Welcome to Wrongful Conviction. Thank you for having me, my friend. Like Appreciate I always it. say, I'm, I'm sorry you're here, but I'm happy you're here. I grew up in the uh, North Philadelphia Abbots Four Projects. I played football, a little bit basketball. Wasn't really good in either. <laughs> but I love music. My dad was a gospel musician. He played the piano, he played the organ. I was in the church choir. I started my own singing group, Sensation, and then we started going across Philadelphia, entering into talent shows. We have interest from music executives in the business. The world was here, and I was running towards it in a beautiful way that everything was coming together. The music, having the daughter being born, I just felt like I was on a natural high. And then life just took this dramatic, Shift. A young lady by the name of Shadell Ray Williams was brutally murdered for a pair of gold earrings. The day that the crime took place, I was on the complete opposite side of town. I was on the bus. I seen an acquaintance, and I went to Abbotsford Projects. My group and I practiced, rehearsed, and so on and so forth, and that was my day. When the crime takes place, the city is in an uproar. The community is crying out in pain. So the city went to each individual neighborhood looking for stick-up boys who did robberies. A group of individuals lied on me and said my name because they were jealous of me. The very moment that I heard my name even mentioned in any type kind of rumor, I did what everyone says an innocent person is supposed to do. I went down to the police station. I stayed down there for several hours, signed in, and they said they didn't want to talk to me. There's been a lot of reporting, a lot of documentation of the, the Rizzo era, and of course he went on to become the mayor. He was actively promoting police violence. Yes. These police officers are from that era, that that Frank Rizzo era, which there were a lot of abuses back in there, in that era in terms of no holds bar, just by any means, just do whatever you have to do and lock people up, you know, unjustly. They did a remarkable story about the Tony Wright case that ran in Rolling Stone six or seven years ago. I don't yeah, know. and they mentioned me in that article too. Oh, they did, yeah. yeah. There was a pull quote where they said that in the early 90s, a black man had a better chance of getting justice in Philadelphia, Mississippi than they did in Philadelphia, true. Pennsylvania. That's true? True. Absolutely true. I was hoping and praying that the truth was going to come out, that somebody was going to come forth with some information or the police was going to do the right thing at that time. But thinking that they were going to do the right thing, that's a fairy tale. That's, 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 nobody should believe that foolishness. Not dealing with the people that I was dealing with. You go back and you study the cases that they done been involved in, you will see that they did this, the same pattern to me they did to many other uh, men and women the exact same way. It's funny, my last night on the street, I was in church. We were talking with a, uh, a music producer and a label, and we had, had to meet in their church later on. That morning, I was arrested. I guess it would be like 4 o'clock in the morning. I was at my dad's apartment, and I heard the slam of the door. Next thing you know, you hear a bang. Boom, 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 boom. So I jump up. 
I'm barely dressed. They just barrel their way through the door. They shut the F up, pushing me around, threw me against the wall, guns drawn on you. Then they handcuffed me and they manhandled me into the petty wagon. And it's dark back there and you riding back there and you hitting every bump. And you get into the police station and everybody's looking at you like you're some kind of monster and they put you in a room, multiple cops coming in saying different things, you're gonna die by lethal injection. I just told the truth because I had nothing to hide. I didn't have a lawyer because I didn't need a lawyer. From the moment that I gave a statement, they actually went out and started hiding the truth about my innocence. And from there, I was charged with capital murder, um, first degree murder, capital murder. I just turned 21 years old. I'd never been locked up before ever in my life. At some point in time, you know you're not going home, right? It, it, it sinks in. I started praying, like, that's a mistake. They ain't they gonna get this right. And it, that didn't happen. It just keep going from there. There's always hope, you know, a flicker of hope that the jury is gonna see the truth, that they're gonna be able to ascertain that what they're saying doesn't add up, but it didn't work out like that. You had um, not only alibi witnesses right. who were either silenced or uh, threatened or, yes. you know, various different yeah. uh, tactics were yeah. employed to make sure that right. they, you know, the alibis that you had that were uh, basically airtight yes. never made it in front of a jury. Sure, right. But also, the fact that the description didn't match at all. I mean, they described a guy who was 5'10", and uh, if you're 5'10", right. then I might as well play center for the Knicks. You're 5'4", right? I'm 5'4". So the physical description was that the perpetrator was 5'10 to 6 foot tall, 180 to 200 pounds, and I weighed 125 pounds. I was 5'4". There were nine witnesses but only three testified at trial. And the reason why the other six didn't testify is because they clearly said that I wasn't the perpetrator and that they wasn't going to lie for the police. These police officers made witnesses lie, and they turned me into this monster where they had to get me out of society so that people could ride the bus without fear or wear jewelry without fear. It was horrifying for me. There was a moment where the jury foreman and another jury member was going to sleep. You can't be focused on the trial if you're going to sleep. The judge gets, gets the verdict from the foreman. And you hear, you know, guilty. Um, my mother started crying. My sister was shaking back and forth, and they gave me the death penalty. The judge stands you up and tells you you're going to die by lethal injection. And um, next thing you know, you're being shipped out of the county prison and you going upstate to be on death row. It feels like a gun is literally being held to your head every day when you're on death row. And it is a day-to-day -day assault on a human soul. That's what death row is. The light in the cell stays on 24 hours a day. So you live for 25 years and yeah. never having darkness. Right. From the moment I stepped foot in prison, um, I had the guards trying to kill me and set me up, and the prisoners trying to kill me. They tried to light the cell on fire with me in there. It's a jungle, you know? And um, survival and proving my innocence was all I had on my mind. When I initially meet my youngest daughter, I meet her in prison. I just brought this incredible little being into the world, right? 
that I want to protect, and I can't. And I can't protect my oldest daughter. I was a wreck. You had two execution dates set. Yes. What exactly is an execution warrant? It's a piece of paper, and they give you a copy of it saying that you're going to die on this day. And unless you get a stay of execution from a judge, you're dead. They're going to take you, strap you down to a gurney, and pump sodium pentothal into your veins. And in your case, they went so far as to ask you the questions, what do you want your last meal to be? Like What I wanted my last meal to uh, be and where I wanted my body shipped and who were the two people that I wanted them to call once they killed me. So imagine you actually knowing when you're going to die. It's very horrifying. From the moment I stepped foot in prison, I started writing um, organizations, activists, all over the country trying to get help. I would put 50 letters within a 24-hour period in the door. There was a little crest in the door, or the guard would have to uh, open up the slot door where they put the food trays in to get the mail, because I would be writing so many letters to anybody that would listen. And it would be a sheet, and it would break down all the facts of the case, who to contact, to get involved, and to help free me. That's what I did for 25.5 years up until my release. I must have wrote over 50,000 or more letters. Easy. I went on a website, I don't even think it exists no more, called Cyberspace Inmates. And every, you know, other prisoners was up there for pen piles. I ain't do none of that. I went up there and said, I'm innocent, I need help. And the first two people to write me was Tracy and Dave Lamori from Canada. They started the Canadian Coalition Against the Death Penalty because of me. If I knew anybody or I thought anybody was true to their convictions, I would write them a letter if I got a legitimate address or them. That's how I was able to get some of my uh, supporters that are notable, like Susan Sarandon. They came by way of me writing my supporters, you know, and them getting the address. And I literally turned the cell I was in to a library. The lawyers sent me books, legal books. I started studying the law. I had to. It's the only reason I'm sitting here right now talking to you. A friend sent me a book, A Man's Search for Meaning, by Dr. Victor E. Franco. And Dr. Victor E. Franco was fond of quote Nietzsche. And there was this quote in that book that I took and I applied to myself. And the quote was, he who has a why can bear with almost any how. My why was my dad my mom, and my daughters. One of the worst experiences I ever had in prison is when my dad died. I was sitting in the cell, and I was working on the Justice for Jimmy campaign. A guard came up to the cell door. He said, your dad died. And just walked away. How do you process something like that? Anybody that know me know, know that me and my dad was tight. So I missed 25.5 years with my dad, and then he died. I miss my youngest daughter being born. I miss the first time my oldest daughter went to kindergarten. I miss taking them to amusement park or you know, uh, taking them shopping and things like that. Is that fair that I miss all of that? It's unfair. It's wrong in every sense of the word. You can't get that time back. I got a phone call from the lawyers, the counselor, and the unit manager came to the door and said, you got to call your lawyers. Amy Rowe is like a sister to me. She's my lawyer, but she, I call her sister. And Ryan Giles is like a brother to me. I call him brother. And I get him on the phone, 
and they pronounce my entire name, James A. Dennis. They never do that. So they say, James A. Dennis, the truth has come out. The truth has come out. And they just kept saying it over and over. She believes in you. She knows the truth. She believes in you. And you still don't get the magnitude of it, right? I didn't. When they did come up to the prison and I read the legal opinion, they put it up against the glass right away so I could see it. And the first sentence said, James A. Dennis was wrongly convicted for a crime. In all probability, he did not commit. That meant more to me than anything in the world. That started the ball rolling of me getting out. Where it gets really weird, and this is not, unfortunately, not unique to your case. Right, no. But is that after your conviction was overturned by Judge Brody, right? Right. You, you remained in prison for several years. Yes. So I remained in jail for over three, three and a half years. Any words you want to say before we leave? I've <laughs> <laughs> never seen that face on here before. That is fantastic. All right, get in the car, let's go. Today is an okay day. Today is an okay day. And we had this moment, you know what I mean, that we had been talking about having for 17 years. And then you get in the van, they started playing Philadelphia Freedom by Elton John, which was kind of cool. And then it, Patti LaBelle, Boys of Men, Meek Mills, and you know what I mean? You gotta have the sound of Philadelphia, you know what I mean? So I can feel like I'm home. First thing I ate was some french fries with some onions and ketchup on it and a vanilla milkshake. I had some David Sunflower seeds. Don't ask me why, because I can't tell you, right? It's just what I had. You can see that there's this moment with me and my mom where we just sitting there and we just hold the hands. And it's surreal, like, but it's still like an outer body experience. When I hugged my daughters, it was still like an outer body experience. Like this is something that you dreamed about and you waited for 25.5 years to happen. And now that it's happening, it doesn't feel real. And you're still waiting for somebody to pinch you and wake you up. And then you be back in prison. I went through that for a long time after I got home. Like. Am I going to wake up and this is going to be a dream? cases every month of innocent people coming home. Why is that? That's corruption. That's not a mistake. The only way that corruption is ever going to stop is if we hold the prosecutor and police officers accountable and they go to prison for when they violate and they send innocent people to jail and when they violate people's constitutional rights. Am I worried about them coming to steal my life away again? Yes. Am I worried about them at any given time being able to set me up or kill me in the streets of Philadelphia? Yes. And it's the same thing that black and Latino people and poor white people think about every day of their life. We live in fear. I use my bitterness to fuel me to advocate for other innocent people. There are innocent women and men all over this country who each individual in their everyday walk of life can help. I had a group of everyday individuals that were my supporters all over the world that championed my cause day in and day out. They became my voice when I had no voice. So don't say in your everyday life that you can't make a difference because you actually can. I give it to you.
never ever give up. Just no matter what you do, no matter what your dream is, is chase at it with reckless abandonment. Go for it. Peace. Thank you for taking the time to learn this important story. But please remember, it's not an isolated incident. Best estimates are that 10,000 people are wrongfully convicted in the U.S. each and every year for crimes they didn't commit. And these wrongful convictions mean that the real perpetrator may still be out there. There's no justice for the victim's families and that we all lose when the criminal justice system or injustice system we rely on in a fair and just society becomes corrupted. If you want to hear more about this story, you can listen to the full Wrongful Conviction podcast in the link below. And if you want to see more of these stories, please subscribe to the channel.